Hello, welcome to the online service of Louisville United Methodist Church. Wherever you are worshiping from today, we are so glad that you are worshiping with us. And we hope that this experience of worship will help you to feel a sense of God's incredible peace, grace, and love that is for all people. Before we get started with our service of worship, I want to share just a few important announcements with you. I would like to let you know that our contemporary 9 a.m. service will be moving from the parking lot indoors to the fellowship hall starting on Sunday, July 4th. I also want to encourage you to click on the link to the digital opportunity form that was either in the email that you got this from or the Facebook post. Um, in this link, there are lots of different ways that you can serve and you can grow in your faith here at Louisville United Methodist Church. If you'll fill out the form so that we know how to connect you with the right information and the right people, that would be so helpful to us. God is up to so many wonderful things in our midst and we want you to be a part of it. So church, let us now go to God in prayer, knowing that God hears us, knowing that God is with us. And I will end my prayer with the Lord's Prayer. I encourage you to say that with me. Let us pray. Holy, holy, holy God, in calling forth creation from the void, revealing yourself in human flesh, and pouring forth your wisdom to guide us, you manifest your concern for your whole universe. You invite us as your people to gather the world's needs into our hearts and bring them before you. Holy, holy, holy God, fill us with strength and courage, with discernment and compassion, that we may be your instruments of justice and love in this world, that it may be on earth as it is in heaven. God, we know that you know the things that are in our hearts, the worries that we carry, the joys that we have in our hearts. And God, we trust that you are listening to us this day as we join our voices together and pray the prayer that your son Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Church, I do want to let you know that during this time, there are different ways that you can give back a portion of what God has blessed you with. You can go to our website, www.lewisvilleumc.org, and click on the online giving page to give online, or you can drop off a check or mail a check to the church office, and we can take it from there. Church, we are so glad that you have joined us today for worship. Our scripture today comes from the Old Testament book of Isaiah. I'm going to be reading chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraphs touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. 
send me. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Eternal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we have heard your scriptures read, and now we ask that you would speak through them to us today. Let us hear your voice calling to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. A song can be a powerful thing. Back before COVID shut Broadway down, I remember reading a story about the revival of a play called The Trip to Bountiful. And shortly after intermission, something really remarkable seemed to always happen. One of the singers who played a character named Mrs. Watts, she would plop down on a bus station bench and just worn out by her travels and weighed down by all of her troubles, she would begin to sing, Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. And a reviewer from the New York Times said that as soon as the first note was sung, there was a palpable stirring among the black uh, patrons of the audience, which, you know, with this play having a mostly black cast, they drew in large numbers. And uh, by the time Mrs. Watts would stand up and she threw her arms out and picked up the volume, the whole audience was singing along. Everybody just joined in the song. Now, especially on Sunday matinees after church, they really found that, you know, people just, it was a full-throated chorus to the point where it, it brought down the house. It just shook, uh, shook the rafters. It shook the theater. And this took the, the uh, cast and the crew by surprise because even in the most popular musicals, right, people just don't start singing along. You know, that's not something that you do. But there was something special they found out really quickly about this song. And I love that story, even though I know I'm not a great singer, but I love that story because to me, it speaks about the power of a song, especially a church song, right? Now, we know that, you know, there may be some Sundays when you watch online church or when you come back for in-person service that you leave worship and think, I have no idea what Paul was talking about today. <laughs> like, I, what was the point he was trying to make again? You know, and it's just that particular sermon doesn't resonate with you. But there's something about music, right, that sticks with us, that we carry with us in our hearts. Now, Debbie knows about that. She can explain that too. Travis knows about that. And the early Methodists, they knew this too. The Methodist movement, which started in the Church of England, was led by two brothers, Charles and John Wesley. And Charles loved to write music. He loved to write hymns, including some that we sing today. Hark the Herald Angels Sing, Christ the Lord is Risen Today, some of our favorites. Um, and uh, so much so that the early Methodists were known as a singing people. Uh, the, the early circuit riders used to take two books with them in their saddle. They would carry a Bible and a hymnal. So that people started to say, if you want to know what Methodists believe, open a hymnal. Now, these songs that we sing together, um, these songs of faith, they may not mean much uh, to your average person on the street in New York City or anywhere else, right? But for us, they mean so much, right? They are a statement of faith. They remind us who we are and, and who God is and what matters most in life. Now, today, I know, is Memorial Day weekend, and so, of course, we remember the, the sacrifice of, of those who died to protect our freedom. We, we also know that many people use this three-day weekend as a chance to get away, and for some, it's the first time in a long time that you've been able to travel, so maybe you're watching this from vacation this weekend. But for us in the church, today is a special day as well. It's a day called Trinity Sunday. And it's kind of the transition uh, between the Easter season and what we call ordinary time. And on Trinity Sunday, it's the only Sunday in the church's calendar where instead of celebrating an event that happens in the Bible, like something in Jesus's life, instead we celebrate an idea. And of course, on Trinity Sunday, we remember and celebrate the idea that the one true God 
has revealed himself to us as um, has three distinct but equally divine persons that we call the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, in a way, I think Trinity Sunday is kind of the perfect uh, ending to our past two sermon series. You may remember going back to Christmas, we we um, kind of retold the stories of Jesus and, and reminded ourselves, what did Jesus do anyway? Um, and then we asked, what's next? As we saw how the Spirit inspired the disciples to be the continuation of the Jesus story. Um, and so we can see it's, it's a good reminder for us of how uh, the, the notion of the Trinity, of a God who is both one and three, that that didn't start out as an abstract idea, right, as a, a theological debate, but instead it's really rooted in, in the, the real life experience of people and how they encountered God in their lives and in the world and how they wrote about that in the Bible that we had today. Now, people have long tried to find words to put around the Trinity to explain it. Um, and, uh, you know, one example might be in the Nicene Creed, probably the most famous example, which is really the standard that we have for talking about the Trinity. Um, and we're going to be reciting that in the traditional service this Sunday. If you haven't read that one or don't know that one by heart, then you could Google that and look it up. It's a good one to commit to memory. Um, but there are other metaphors and ideas that people use as well to try to think about what the Trinity means. You know, in, in our family, um, in my family, since the beginning of the pandemic, I've been giving my kids, Millie and Henry, piano lessons. And uh, most recently, we've been learning about chords, about harmonic chords. And one of my old professors at, at Duke Divinity has a, a new book out, and um, the book is called Resounding Truth, Christian Wisdom from the World of Music. And he suggests that a three-note chord might be a really helpful way for us to think about the Trinity. So, since we're talking about music and songs today, I'm going to play a three-note co chord for you, and you just listen, all right? So you hear how that is at the same time one chord, and yet you can make out the three distinct notes, right, that are present in it. Pretty cool, huh? Now, um, we know, of course, any human way of trying to capture the mystery and the majesty of our God is going to fall short. Um, but maybe this, this metaphor of a chord is a, a useful reminder that instead of trying to explain the Trinity, you know, maybe the better thing for us to do is to simply sing. <laughs> uh, sing praises to the Trinity, to our God. Now, uh, our scripture today uh, has a beautiful song in it. Um, we hear it resounding from the pages of the Old Testament um, from this angel chorus. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And that comes to us from the prophet Isaiah. Um, the passage starts out by saying, in the year that the king Uzziah died, which would have been about 800 years before the birth of Jesus. And the prophet Isaiah finds himself in the temple, right, in the place of worship. And it's there that he has this incredible experience of the divine, this transcendent experience where the foundations of the, the temple begin to shake and the sanctuary fills with smoke. Now, I wonder what people would do if that happened in church today, right? We'd probably all go running for the exits, you know? Um, some, it's a good thing some people have a plan for that. They know what we would do. Uh, and because in our worship, everything is so um, planned out ahead of time, you know? It's rehearsed. We, we've even written it down um, that it can sometimes feel almost like you are more of a spectator in worship, whether it's at the contemporary or the, the traditional service, like you're kind of sitting back and watching the pastors and the musicians as, as worship plays out in front of you on a stage, you know, and you're, you're just the audience that's watching. And at first, that's kind of what it's like for Isaiah as well, 
right? In this vision that he has, at first he, he kind of sits back and stares in awe at this scene of, of the Lord's throne, which is high and lifted up, and all of these, these seraphs, these six-winged creatures that are swarming around the throne and covering their faces with two of their wings as they, as they cry out in song together. And as he, he watches them and he listens to their song, uh, at first he is reluctant to join in, right? He kind of hangs back. And he says in the passage that, that that's because he feels unworthy, right? He says, woe is me, I'm lost because I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. In other words, he's saying, I'm not good enough to sing with these angels, right? I'm, I'm, I've made too many mistakes. I have too many doubts. But then what happens? God sends one of the angels, one of the seraphs, with a hot coal that the seraph picks up from one of the altars in the temple. And he touches Isaiah's lips with it and says, now all of your guilt has been blotted out, right? You've been delivered from all of your sin. And it's this moment Right? This experience of God's grace and of God's forgiveness in a personal way that changes Isaiah, that makes all of the difference for him. Right? No longer is he a passive spectator. Now he is an active participant in worship to the point where when the voice calls out from the throne, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Um, Isaiah can't help but sing back, you know, this full-throated, hearty reply, here I am, send me. Yes, turns out there is power in a song. Now, that song that we read in Isaiah, Christians have been reading that for years and years and found within it the echo of the Trinity, right? In, in the words, holy, holy, holy. And we recognize it at the end of the Bible in the book of Revelation. We also recognize it in this song, right? So we know that song. You may have heard it before. You're going to hear it again in just a minute here. Um, but by listening to the angels sing, we are reminded who God is. That God is the mighty one, right? The one who is high and lifted up. The one who is more powerful than an earthquake that can shake the foundation of the temple. Who is more mysterious than a smoke-filled sanctuary. Right, who is beyond our capacity for reason. But at the same time, this God is also merciful, coming close to us, close to us, close enough that our sins and our guilt might be purged away, might be blotted out. And the best part is that this one and three God, this God who is both merciful and mighty, is still present to us in our worship today. Right? I'm able to jump off the page of your bulletin and stir up your heart, right? giving you goosebumps or, or um, leaving you in tears. That's the power that God can have, not only through the words that we read and the bread that we break in communion, but yes, in the songs that we sing together. Now, Garrison Keeler. Um, who you may remember was the longtime host of uh, A Prairie Home Companion. I don't know if, you know, people, I don't think it's even on the radio anymore, but Garrison Keillor was a Lutheran, and we'll forgive him for that. But he used to say um, that Methodists, he said something really interesting about Methodists. He said, it's easy to make fun of them for, for our blandness, right, for our fear of, of offending people, and for our strange secret fondness of macaroni and cheese, which I can definitely attest to from all the potlucks that I've been to, covered dish dinners. But he says, nobody can sing like the Methodists. 
He says that many of them are bred from childhood to sing four-part harmonies, which he says is a talent that they pick up from listening, sitting on the lap of, of somebody who is singing alto or tenor or bass and listening to the harmonic intervals by leaning their little head against that person's rib cage. I just thought that was a beautiful way to describe, you know, why we sing, right? We sing together not because we are good enough, not because we have everything figured out, but because we, as a community, as a church family, we have experienced God's grace in a personal way that has changed us, just like it did for Isaiah. We sing because it reminds us who God is and who we are, that God exists as this perfect chord of love and invites us, each one of us, to join in the chorus, asking, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And then, like the stirring of that music moving through the crowd in the theater, we can't help but sing along, here I am, send me. And now, for our benediction on this Trinity Sunday, instead of a usual benediction, I'm going to invite you to make our closing song your prayer. Travis is going to lead us um, in holy, 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 and I invite you to join the chorus of praise. Sinful man.